Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Rise Online Masterclass. We are connecting with another one of our amazing speakers today, and I'm so excited to share this. I feel like the secret we've been holding on to is Miss Yana Robinson, and uh, thank you for being here with us and just being a part of this, uh, this event. How are you doing? I'm good, and I'm so excited to be part of it. I know we've connected around ACE, and it feels, uh, I feel very grateful to, to be coming to RISE and to be speaking with Jeremy. We've done some stuff together, and um, yeah, I'm excited about your why and your vocation and how you devote yourself to women taking up space, and I'm really excited to be part of that. So. Thank you. There's so much alignment. I'm sitting here with your book. I'm like reading poetry now. I'm. <laughs> Yes, my second book is ready, actually. I know. I'm so, I was so oh, excited to see that. So we need to get our hands on a copy. Yes, yes. Uh, but we did one of our Ace Connects events here in Calgary. It was, a, it was a yoga event last weekend. And I read Woman of Distinction. Mm -hmm. And it was just so beautifully timed. Um, and then I had total imposter syndrome. I was like, why am I reading poetry? I shouldn't be reading poetry. And I'm like, no. That's the poem. Like you do this, <laughs> get out of your head. So, tell us a little bit about who you are. Like we've got some people in our community that are super fans, and some people are just discovering you for the first time. So, maybe you can share a little bit about what you're up to in the world. Yeah, I've also just memorized "Woman of Distinction" as a, a spoken word piece. So, if we have time, I could jam on it on this call if we wanted oh, to. Okay, okay. <laughs> We could do that. I'd be open and free flow with you. I love um, it. Yeah. So, uh, well, my name is Yana Robinson, and um, I think it's really important to start with why we do what we do and not what we do. So, I always say that my why is truth, and I fully believe that truth is our greatest medicine. And continuously being open to our truth as we evolve as humans in relationships and work. Um, is I think the greatest work of our life is just continuously staying honest and staying open. And my father always says, even when we are standing still, the earth is moving and therefore we are changing. And so, um, yeah, I work largely around sharing truth and also with people holding space for them to become accessible to their truths. Because I think that when we have the courage to live in alignment with our truth, it's really where freedom lies. And, um, so I am a poet. I have been writing since I was in grade three. I've been writing poetry since I was in grade three. Um, I am an author. Uh, my second book actually comes out. We have a book launch event next week, or this week, Wednesday. Um, and uh, I have been a coach and mentor for around five or six years in a multitude of personal development, business consulting, and creative writing coaching. Uh, I have been speaking and hosted retreats and workshops all over the world, had an apparel brand that I just liquidated for three years that was called This Is For The Woman, which is now evolving into like an educational platform with courses and the why of that little business brand is for women to walk tall and take up space, uh, which I really feel is also what our world really needs to rebalance and heal. Um, I think that's, mo oh, and I make films. I make little films, <laughs> short poetry films. Um, so par partial director, I don't actually film them myself, but I direct them. Uh, and I think that it's so beautiful to let messages that resonate or that I feel called to create on a, put them in different platforms. Reading a poem, when I titled my books after poems and I like to make films of them. And I think that it's, and I had t-shirts that were all the different poems. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I multi-platform my work in a lot of ways uh, that feels in resonance and um, yeah, and I teach women's groups, all kinds of stuff. So many beautiful things you're, you're up to in the world. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm excited to connect with you. I'm excited to have you out in our community. You like, tell me a little bit about what that really means. That truth is our medicine. Mm -hmm. I think that when a lot of our world right now is really depressed and anxious and most of the suffering that a lot of, and I will say first world human beings are, are you know, Canada, US and places, uh, a lot of the suffering collectively is around, I think, being away from the truth of who we are 
and you know depression louise l hay talks about the root of it being feeling trapped and um you know being suicidal is about seeing things in black and white and i think that when we continuously make choices that abandon ourselves which a lot of women do because we're nurturers we're we're wanting to people please we're wanting to hold space for people we are like this loving compassionate energy but when we start serving the truths of other people or the desires of other people we walk away from ourselves and i think if we walk farther farther enough away from ourselves and in our intuition and the truth of who we are, um, we can wind up feeling really trapped and unhappy. And a lot of my work to be here was, I did that same journey and that same walk into living in complete inauthenticity to coming home. And I'm still continuously every day coming home. This concept of arriving anywhere is a disillusionment. <laughs> Like we're always arriving into deeper versions of who we are. Um, and so, yeah, I think that when we can really truly heal ourselves, which I believe is also healing this world, when we just sit down and we're honest with where we are not honoring in our life and where we are out of alignment in our lives. Um, and so, yeah, working with coaching clients or anyone one-on-one, -on -one, it's like, I joke that people come and sit with me and they're like, I want the red bicycle. And I go, great, baby go get the red bicycle. Cause it's like, we just want permission. We want permission to do the things that we already know that we want to do, but we're afraid. And my, my belief on why we are afraid to have the courage to make choices is there is like a reptilian lizard brain with setting boundaries, with quitting things, getting out of relationships, any kind of boundaries that truly believes that if we set these boundaries or we say no, or we make these big shifts that like, we might die and like go homeless or be kicked out of our communities. And um, on a very, very unconscious, like very reptilian level, back in the day when we lived in caves together and there was like saber toothed tigers, and we were in these little tribes. Um, if you got kicked out of a community, you actually would die. Mm. Like you needed the community to survive. And now it's like you can get kicked out of 150 communities and you will still survive. So we, it's interesting that we put on masks to fit in and have community when we're really also shorting everyone around us from actually knowing who we are, whether it's our husbands or our family or our coworkers. We're so afraid of not belonging that we short ourselves the opportunity of belonging. And there's only one of us in this world that has this, you, we're so unique and the unique gifts that we have to give in our business and our thoughts, those are all only going to exist inside each person. And so it's so sad that we think that we need to exist as anything else and that we short this world knowing who we uniquely are um, and think that that's like a defense mechanism as well. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think that becoming honest with the truth of who we are and acting in courageous action with that is what frees us. So when people are feeling, I had a one client at a retreat once who said she had a, we, we did a one-on-one -on -one together and she was like, I have, a, I have a history of depression and I'm really happy, but I'm afraid that I'm going to get depressed again. And so I had her account the last three times that she was depressed. And the first time she was living in a city that she was done with, you know, cities are like soulmates. <laughs> Sometimes they're for a season, a reason, or a lifetime. Oh. Second time she was in a job that she didn't want to be in anymore. And the third time she was in a relationship that she was over. And then I looked at her and said, and when did the depression shift? And she said, when I left the city, when I quit the job, when I left the relationship. So I believe we have the own keys to our freedom and we can untrap ourselves at any moment if we have the courage to become available to our truths. And I think that we're not doing anyone any kind of service by not being true with all of who we are. Because if, if we are all of who we are around people and we've given them the opportunity to know somebody who is anything but what we are, they're creating a false connection with something. Mm. And if we start to be who we are and those people fall out of our lives, we also aren't losing anything because they were in resonance with something that wasn't even us. Right. Very philosophical. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's deep, right? And that I can, I can see how, like, this is the stuff they should be teaching us in school, really. Like how to be your authentic self, how to be true. Because 
what you're saying sounds so easy and romantic of like, just be who you are. But for many of us, we have years and years of masks and disguising ourselves and following each other or following other people's like dreams for our own lives or doing things because society expected the, them of us. But, it, and so it becomes a little bit more complicated the more weaved into that you get. So how, you know, how do we, how do we start making those shifts back to ourselves? I would love to share the beginning of my story. Please, yes. As I was trapped and I untrapped myself and I can give you direct moments and I know we can have context sometimes to understand like what does mm -hmm. that look like? So um, about, there's my Canadian. You're Canadian, it's fine. <laughs> I'm living in the States and whenever I say about now I'm self-conscious of it because I've ever <laughs> Um so six years ago, I was living in Edmonton, Alberta. And it's funny, yesterday I was walking with my boyfriend talking about coffee. He's like, should we go to Starbucks? And I was like, I can't drink Starbucks anymore because it reminds me of a life that I didn't love. And I was uh, bartending and selling condos for a developer. And I would work on the weekends till like four in the morning, three in the morning, and then I would get up, get perfect, perfected, straighten my hair, put on a suit. And I would go to a show suite at 11 AM and I would sell condos and I would always get an Americano from Starbucks with cream and sugar. And I was so unhappy. And what I would do is I would go through these phases where I would make a ton of money and then I would travel the world, you know, from 18 to 24, I was always somewhere for four or six months out of the year. I think getting a degree in ourself is we can't always do that without traveling. And there are as uh, this is Sophie Everett's word, she has a, a women's retreat company. She told me that there is a part of women she does not believe they can meet unless they are on adventure. And so when I turned 18, I like went straight to Thailand and was like, fuck school, I'm gonna go explore. I had a gypsy mom that encouraged it. Um, and I was so at joy in the adventures and I was writing and I was expressing and then I would come home to Edmonton and I would be working, serving, beers to drunk people till four in the morning or, and filling up coffee with shitty bar food and selling like I was so it lacked my life was authentic half the time and for a while that was sustainable it was okay to travel and then come back but then it wasn't sustainable anymore and it wasn't enough for me I was like I need to have a life that is fully authentic and this is only working half the time and uh I, I've always, I've been writing since I was in grade three. I've been writing poetry since I was younger than that. I had a story published in grade three um, and have always been connected to um, one of my biggest what's and favorite ways to teach. And um, I, I remember sitting, it was just this quiet, it's these quiet little moments where you can no longer ignore the voice that is there. And I was sitting in a condo. It was like 3.40 p.m. I ended my, my condo job at 4 p.m. I remember sitting there and like hearing this buzzing noise in this condo. And I was wearing this gray suit with white pinstripes and holding this cold Americano from Starbucks that had gone, all the cream was all, you know, it was like gross. And I just remember going, I can't do this anymore. Mm. And I picked up the phone and I called my mom and I said, I just have to change one part of my life. I hate living in Edmonton. It's minus 30 degrees Celsius in the winter. It's ugly. It's full of rednecks and everyone just gets drunk to deal with their lives. <laughs> I have a love-hate relationship with Edmonton. There's some great things about Edmonton, but it's not my soulmate. It's totally not my soulmate. And uh, I was like, I just, I, didn't, I need to change one part of my life. So I was like, I'm gonna move to BC. I love British Columbia. I'm just gonna come to BC. I'm gonna look into writing programs. And I had actually gone and sat down in Edmonton at a lot of universities in the counselor's office. And they told me about creative writing programs or journalism programs. And I would listen to them and I would sit there and go, I'm not convinced I need that and get up and leave. So I wasn't in resonance with being taught, but I was like, maybe in British Columbia, I will be, there'll be something there. And um, so I remember making that phone call. And the other thing that's important to note is I'd had a really poignant um, conversation probably four or six months before that with who then became my mentor, uh, Deanne Whalen. And she is a award-winning filmmaker, author. She's, she was the first woman to make an, a film on Everest. Um, she's a total badass. Right now she's 
walking 24,000 kilometers across Canada, making a film on lost wisdom, talking to First Nations individuals and communities and ancestors that she calls the beacons. Um, because she believes everything we need to know we have forgotten and we need to remember. So she's amazing. She's still amazing. She's always been amazing. Uh, no one is doing anything as cool as her. I actually think she should speak at one of your festivals. Yes, 100%. <laughs> she's on the trail right now, but I already thought of that. Um, and so I, I had been talking with her. Uh, I met her and we went kayaking in the Sunshine Coast six months before this moment. And she was like telling me about how she first started and that she just, she was a, a journalist and was done being a journalist and photographing bodies that were still in flames at a, a scene sometimes. And um, she wanted to go on this expedition, this sovereignty mission with uh, the, it was like First Nations Rangers and military. They go to the most Northern part of Canada by snowmobile and plant a flag. And so she was telling me that her way into filmmaking was she heard about this mission when she was a, a journalist and was like called up the, the people in this office and said, my name is Diane Whalen. I'm a journalist for this, you know, newspaper. I want to come with you. And they were like, who the fuck are you? No. And they hung up on her. <laughs> and then she called them back and was like, I will write a book and I will film a documentary and I'll do like a feature article. And they were like, do you know how to ride a snowmobile? And <laughs> she, said, she lied and was like, yeah, she didn't know. And she went with them. And so she just hurdled herself into this thing. And when I was telling her, where I felt trapped in my life when we were kayaking and what I wanted to do. She said, Yana, just change, just go, just change one part of your life, you know, come, come live in BC and sell condos and bartend here, but shift one part. And I was, so I, I, as soon as I made the choice to go to BC, I was like, I, okay, I need to talk to her to get an um, info on bartending and selling condos. Cause that was my mindset. It was like, I'm still going to do the things I know how to do. I'm just gonna do them somewhere else. And so I called her and she was like, well, yeah, I could, but you want to be an artist, so why don't you come work with me? And uh, <laughs> so I landed an internship with, to my, to this day, the most badass woman I've, I've met, other than my mom, who's pretty badass, but, uh, and then get this for serendipity, which I have to say is like, once you decide that you are going to follow your truth, the universe orchestrates for you. And at maybe 3.50 p.m., 10 minutes later, a woman walked into the show suite. At this point, I'm completely checked out of this job. I'm checked out of Edmonton. I do not want to see this fucking woman. I'm like, get the fuck out of here, woman. And uh, she wants to see a walkthrough at, with construction hats. And we need to like go to this other building that her unit was being built. She wasn't my client. I wasn't going to get, she was my business partner's client that was buying a condo. And I had all this resistance to go because I wasn't going to make money and I was done. And we go and we end up walking through the structure construction going on um having this beautiful conversation about her father who is sick and i support her and listen and we talk i've always always been a supporter and uh and she shared with me that she had a cabin um on the sunshine coast of british columbia which is where Dee lived that she loved and didn't really want to rent out but she needed to move to edmonton to take care of her father and i looked at her and i i said actually like where is your cabin and she said the Sunshine Coast. And I was like, what? And then she showed me a photo of this beautiful cabin. And I was like, this is going to sound crazy. But like 20 minutes ago, I decided I needed to move to BC. Can I rent your cabin? <laughs> and she was like, oh my God, I love you. Yeah. And then I had also this developer ended up screwing me out of like 10 grand. Like they didn't, they actually never. God. I was waiting for all this money. And she was like, you can even live in my cabin for free until that money shows up. Wow. I just have to Gosh, change. Got goosebumps. <laughs> yeah. So, and I actually didn't end up living. I didn't. I actually ended up living somewhere else. But I just. I could have lived there, and that could have been the path. And I just have to share that, like, literally, when you commit to something, the universe will fucking orchestrate for you exactly what you need to get there. Yeah. Not that there's not choices and things and pieces that are going to be hard and. Um, you're, I think that when we commit to our truth, we also get tried sometimes. And the yeah. universe goes, are you really sure you want this? What if we give you a bit more money? What if we do this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that was my the beginning of my journey. And um, yeah, I moved out to the Sunshine Coast of British Columbia. I interned with this fucking phenomenal, 
powerhouse spirit of a woman who does do business only from heart and the feminine and has never sold out. You know, if Netflix and all these huge CBC offers her something, if they will not honor the story she is here to tell, she doesn't do it. So, um, yeah, to go, to go into her story a bit, but um, talk about women and rising. And I believe that uh, rising as a woman is about rising to the light of who we are over and over and over again. And that spending time in the presence of women like Diane or other women who are beacons of light, they are permission to rise deeper and fuller into parts of ourselves we have not owned yet. And I needed to be around somebody who had the courage to go after her art and her truth. And that was pivotal in my journey. And so the reason that we participate in communities of women who are choosing themselves, reasons I do my women's group, the reason why you're doing is so powerful is, I. this is such a good piece too, is like there's this jealousy piece or this, um, we compare ourselves or we feel inadequate because of the light of other women. And mm -hmm. it hurts us so much because everyone is just a mirror to our light. Mm -hmm. And if we can acknowledge that, the way that we, um, I, I talk about this in the context of jealousy, but it's like when we are jealous or envious of somebody, all they are is a mirror to a part of ourselves that we have yet to step into. And the way that we step into it is actually by spending time with them. It's by being friends with them. It's by going up to them and saying, I see your light. It's so bright. It makes me feel small almost. I would really love to go for a coffee. I would really love to hang out. I would really love to be friends. It's finding somebody that you resonate who is a teacher or a mentor and listening to every podcast, book, thing, and devouring that which your soul needs to hear. And so I think that it is so important to be around women who are choosing themselves, who are in their light, because it calls us deeper into the light of who we are, and which is why this conference and what you are doing with women is so important because part of the medicine is knowing that the light that we see everywhere is the light that we are. Our natural state is love. We exist as love. There is That is who we are and we just need to come home to that. And if we exist as love and we are the light that we see everywhere in the world, why would we not try? And why would we not go for anything? Mm -hmm. So beautiful. I so appreciate you sharing that story. Um, just about you stepping in, like by Edmonton, I'm going, I'm going to change one thing. And then you get the internship and like, you obviously didn't sell condos anymore after that. You obviously didn't bartend anymore after that. Um, and you know, it's incredible that Diane, it's Diane, right? Diane. Yeah. It looks like Diane, but it's Diane actually. She's French. Yeah. Yeah. So it's incredible that she sort of took you and she's like, no, no. Yeah, I told you to make one move, but you're actually going to stretch a little further. And I, I, I really love that. So how did you go from this internship and this new city and this new life that you cultivated to yourself to your zone of genius and really into the work that you do now? Mm, yeah. So I have to share this. It's interesting that sometimes as a storyteller and a teacher, I feel like we share the same stories, but I also feel like there are certain stories that are so relatable to the human experience. They need to be told over and over again. Mm -hmm. So the piece of this journey that I have to tell is that although you're saying, well, of course it was easy. You were allowed to live in a cabin rent free and all these things were there. Um, so I also got pregnant and uh, as I was moving to British Columbia and there was a part of me that uh, it was a total wrench thrown into the thing, and um, I sat in it for a while, and, and my, my piece was like, yeah, I don't want to be a mother right now. I want to be a mother to different things, mm. and I ended up having an abortion, and I had the abortion in this little cabin, um, where I, when I, it was like the week after I'd moved to British Columbia, and um, I remember just like going from having such a community, I still have community in Edmonton and support to, I knew two people on the Sunshine Coast. My mom lived in Vancouver. The, my lame ass boyfriend uh, didn't show up for the appointment and uh, we broke up. So I was healing the, the piece around him not being there as well as our relationship and um, had this hard moment. And I had been writing online a little bit before this and writing some, I've been always writing, but just I'd shared some pieces on Elephant Journal, but I hadn't touched my why yet. I hadn't touched what I was here to say. And I wrote this piece the day after I had my abortion, I was laying in bed healing and I just, this, the, the emotional experience and process of from day one to choosing what I was going to do um, and all of the pieces in between, you know, going through, um, 
having friends and family be neutral or not neutral, having doctors tell me that I would regret it if I got an abortion and, you know, telling, telling doctors off and saying, that's so not your choice. And if I was a 14 year old girl sitting here and you told me that I would regret having an abortion, I might've actually listened to you. So like, watch your fucking tongue. Mm -hmm. Um, I talked about, uh, I did, I did a, the day before my abortion, I know, I don't know when the soul enters the body. I don't, I, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different people that talk about that. And, um, I had a conversation with my belly in front of the fire and just said, Hey, little soul, I don't know if you're in there, but like right now is not the time. And I feel so grateful that you've chosen me to be your mother and that floating around, looking down at all of the women and all of the wounds that you chose me. And if you want to come back later when I'm ready for you, I would love to walk this life with you. And if you want to go find another mother with right now, I totally understand. And I love you. And um, I shared everything, every part of my process, every piece. And it was the scariest thing that I had ever written. And I, I decided to put it away for like 30 days or 60 days and don't even look at it. I was like, I don't know where that came from. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I wrote that. I don't know if it'll ever live in the public eye. Um, but that was, that was really raw. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I, I sat with it for a long time because I think it's important to not to know why we're sharing something. You know, it's in a world of Instagram and social media, we can share things before we've actually processed them. And it's really important to sit in if we are ready to let the world have an experience of an experience that we've had. And so I did wait. And I decided to share it because there was so much shame around abortion and that also I wish that I could have read something like that when I was going through my process. And so, um, I did not share it to throw that guy under the bus. I did not share it for attention. Um, and that's hard sharing pieces of pain or suffering is that the world will try and give you console or c to console you. And um, that's not why I share any of my suffering is um, in that piece. So uh, say going back, I decided to just share it on Elephant Journal, which for me was 17 million readers that were anonymous. And I was like, that's safe, but like, I'm not going to share it on my social media because that's going to be like Joe that I went to high school with. And someday I'll be in a coffee shop in Edmonton and he'll be like, hey, I read your article on abortion. I'll have to have this uncomfortable conversation. So it's actually harder to be vulnerable with the people directly around us than strangers. <laughs> um, so I remember getting the, the little notification, your article has been published the email ding. I was living in my cabin, watching the rain drip off these prayer flags in my woodshed. And I remember acknowledging that I had to share it with my social media and my friends and my family, because I was so at peace with my choice that absolutely nothing anyone could say could alter the light within me. And I had spent enough time in it and it was vital that it was said out loud. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I shared it and I got called everything from like woman of the year to murderer by the first man I ever slept with, uh, who was deeply Christian and religious. So that's part of where he came from. Yeah. And I also got 300 comments and messages from women who, uh, had had abortions. And one of them said, um, you know, I, I was, I think she was 14 or 16 and I was, I was dropped off at the clinic by my father and he told me not to tell my mother or anyone else. And like, you're the first person that I'm telling. Yeah. And in that moment, I really felt the why of my work just like walk straight up to me. And I was like, oh, truth, permission. There's this place of we feel safe when other people, when the truth piece, it gives other people permission to feel safe to also express and to touch parts of themselves. It's the great understanding is that when people understand themselves and can eloquently share it or communicate it, and my word, words is my, my go-to, um, that people get permission to understand themselves deeper, which frees them and gives them the same medicine. So I have been sharing slabs of my heart since that moment. I have been leading with truth in moments where it's also not a beautiful thing. I've shared, I have poems in my second book coming out. There's cobwebs on her vagina about being the other woman and that experience. So it's not just the glory of sharing the slabs of my heart when um, I'm in my power, but also my shadow and moments of stepping out of authenticity and integrity. And um, 
I think that it is important. Gay Hendricks, who's my mentor, says the great leaders of the 21st century have honed in on their authentic gifts and through living their authentic gifts are inspiring others to do the same. Mm -hmm. So it is just about touching who we are and what we have to give. And what I feel I have to give is words and truth and space holding for other truth. So um, my work then evolved. I shared that on Elephant Journal. I became their feature columnist. I had a full-time job just writing for a few years um, and then uh, met kind of morphed in a really beautiful way into holding space because I was spending six or seven hours a day responding to comments and messages and emails and the Elephant Journal staff was like, you respond to every comment. We've never had a writer that does that. And then I was like, okay, I'm super burning out and money is energy. So like, this is a service. So then I opened up a mentoring part of my website and I had like 20 people apply. I remember sitting on my couch hearing like, ding, ding, ding of all these applications. Um, and so, yeah, I really, I don't really like the word life coach, but I have been, I've been leading people into the truth of who they are in the context of personal development, business, and their writing voices for six years. And that's something that I, I'm learning to balance with the writing piece, because writing is my largest vocation, uh, the, the largest way I love to teach. Um, and I love there, I, I get a, a lot of pleasure and I learn so much about humanity through coaching and it's balancing those pieces of the demand from the outside world for you to do these things that come in because there's always offers and opportunities and, um, and also quietly this, this hum of, you know, and as, as it's good to, as entrepreneurs to go, what is my favorite way to teach? Mm -hmm. And to like hone in there. And so I think that balancing our what's and our services and what we do because the world desires us to live there and what we do because we desire, you know, to be doing uh, is, a, is an ongoing walk. Mm. So, yeah, so I've been doing lots. I did retreats. People talk, asked me to teach workshops and then I was like, oh, I'll, if people are if people are paying me to teach workshops at their retreats, I'll do retreats. So I led retreats internationally. And then I was like, I don't like producing retreats. And now I speak at other people's retreats. Uh, I started an apparel brand and then liquidated it because six months ago, I just woke up and decided that selling t-shirts was focusing too much on what I have to say. That if you sell t-shirts on the side of the stage. And I was like, I'm spending too much energy here. What do I want to say on the stage? So I'm currently in an evolution of clearing space to really hone in on that more and deeper. Um, and I think that's a big piece that we need to know is that living in our truth doesn't mean that we always know everything and what's going to happen. It's just continuously being vulnerable to what our truth sh shows us. And David White, who I love, who's a poet, is like, you know, our greatest work is to meet who we are as we unravel. And who you are will look like a stranger as you evolve. You look in a mirror and be like, what? This is me? I'm going to liquidate the apparel company I just built up or I'm going to quit this job or move here. And it's like, we need to continuously make space for who we are um, as we evolve um, inside of ourselves, I think. The, you're, uh, there's so much there. The work that you do is so beautiful and, and vulnerability truly is your zone of genius. And I, that's where our alignment is because what's really powerful is where one woman speaks her truth. When one woman is courageous enough to get up and say, this is who I am. This is what's going on for me. This is real for me. All of a sudden there's this shift that happens of another woman saying, oh my gosh, I'm not alone here. I don't have to walk through this alone. I'm going through this too. And I was so afraid to say that. And, and the foundation of your work around vulnerability is just, it's, it's so, it's so powerful. Mm -hmm. Um, you said, you mentioned that Gay Hendricks is uh, a mentor of yours and I could tell by some of the way that you speak and you're writing and you're talking about upper limits and, um, Gay Hendricks, I'm reading the big leap right now. So it's a part of our book club. I know, right? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful. I love it. I love it so much. And he talks about, you know, how fear shows up in those moments when we're about to do something really amazing and it keeps us like Ugh, right here. And these upper limits we create for ourselves um, really hold us back from leaning into truly who we are. Can you share a little bit about upper limits? Yeah. Um, it's interesting because there's, so there's four main upper limits and um, one of you, yeah, one of them is around being a burden 
like feeling like our success is a burden to the maybe our loved ones or that we will be a burden if we are a success or that life will be a burden because we don't have this anonymity anymore. Um, and uh, yeah, I have a funny story about that. And then the second piece is not wanting to outshine others, you know, and being a, a gifted, he talks about many kids being gifted and um, not, not wanting to shine too bright unless we take away the space for others, which I believe that we need to walk tall to ride people gently. Like you don't need to crouch. It's okay to rise as well. I'm going to need to do the woman of distinction poem at the end of this. Um, and then uh, the third one is there. I, I do not deserve to receive the abundance, love and success of who I am in this world because I believe that I'm fundamentally flawed. Mm. There's something wrong with me. And the fourth is that we feel like to fully embody our zone of genius and our, the, the you know, the magnitude of what we want to step into and what that looks like is that we will abandon those people that are close to us and that we will have to like leave people behind and be disloyal. Um, and I think that, you know, human beings have always been more afraid of their life. We, we live in suffering. We like drink our suffering up. Um, suffering is one of our greatest teachers. And so um, I believe that the payoff of anxiety because well, we often get anxiety when we're about to play big or, or go for our genius. And the payoff of anxiety is an emotion when we create it in our bodies that we don't risk. And the way to risk and the way to beat anxiety and the way to step past our fear is literally to be afraid and do it anyway. And we will never be ready. It's like, are you willing? And we get to a point, I think, where we're so fucking done with our suffering that we can't not be willing anymore. At least that was my experience was like, I'm so done choosing my suffering. And one of the things I've learned as a teacher and a coach is that we are here with soul contracts to learn about different things. And um, people's suffering is their greatest teacher. And sometimes the most enlightened thing I can do as a coach or a teacher is literally let somebody be in their suffering and their sabotage until they choose differently. And that's really important to know as healers and guiders and teachers of this world is that it is okay that people sometimes do choose their suffering because they will get to a point where they will be sick of eating their shit <laughs> and choose differently. And maybe they won't. And maybe that's the experience that they came onto this earth to have. Um, and I, I've, so I forget exactly what we were talking about, but I think that we stay in fear for long enough to understand what we need to know about fear. And hopefully we get the experience of knowing it's this it's this stretch i learned this in this amazing group called uh, integrity seminars they're actually based out of edmonton see there's good things in edmonton um and she talks about our context and our comfort zone so when i moved from edmonton to british columbia to live in a cabin there was this stretch of i don't know if i'm going to be supported in this new experience and as human beings we're such dicks we want we want to have the trust that we will be supported before we have the experience but the only way to risk is to not know and to have the experience and then later get trust but we do it backwards we're like well i want to know i'll be supported like i hate my job and i want to make comic books but i don't know if i'll be supported so i'm going to stay here but it's like we have to have the courage to be vulnerable to new experiences to then be supported there. And one of the things I'm a master at and one of the things I love to teach, I teach our emotional relationships with money and um, is changing, keeping the same context of financial abundance every month, but just changing how I make it. Like one month I was like, I'm going to stop coaching and my apparel company is going to make 20 grand. And we did, um, or just playing around with that and not being fixated on one what, you know, Simon Sinek talks about our what's as our services or our offerings. I'm teaching a woman's group right now that I love. And as you're saying, I think women witnessing the vulnerability of other women and then stepping into themselves or having a moment of being in suffering. It's like, we learn so much if we pay attention to the experiences of those around us. And there's so much power in sitting in groups and, and being able to witness that vulnerability and choosing ourselves as well. And I love my woman's group, but I might wake up in four months and, and choose to change entirely what I'm doing. Um, and so I think that overcoming and stepping into our zone of genius and overcoming our upper limits is, yes, we have to acknowledge where we are choosing our suffering, why we're afraid. We have to be afraid and do it anyway. We need to risk and choose to overcome anxiety. And then we have to continuously stay vulnerable to the experience of our evolution in the marriage that we have with our work.
Mm-hmm. And um, our vocation, our calling, our dharma, our life's work should evolve just as we evolve. It is not a stagnant thing. Um, I, I am not fixated on any of the ways that I give my services or my why or my, you know, I might hate writing in six years, who knows? Um, so we just need to continuously stay open. And um, I think that's the greatest work of any of the work is like, can I stay vulnerable to my truths and know that like pretty much nothing is impermanent? I love that. Nothing is fixed. And you said that at the beginning of this conversation too. And you're like, we never truly arrive because we're always in the evolution. And, and so we should be, if we're continuously doing the work and, you know, discovering little pieces of ourselves, like we're always going to be in progress. We're always going to be in process. And that's, that's also really beautiful. So tell me what you're excited about for the rise event and then let's do the poem. Yeah. 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 So um, I think the biggest piece there is, uh, how many women? There's 300 women. How many women are? There'll be about 250 women. Yeah, 250 women. So, um, I'm very excited to witness and experience what you've created. And the, the biggest piece, in which I touched on a little bit briefly, is like, I think that we need often permission in that space of rising into our light and our power and being around other women who are choosing themselves and witnessing people who are living in alignment or in their zone of genius, people that you have speaking and sharing, it's just this further, it's just deeper permission, deeper permission, deeper permission, deeper permission. And um, being around 250 women committed to themselves and their light is number one, there's just so much many more women doing their work than men. I just have to say it. It's amazing. (laughs) I feel like we're so, women are so fucking committed to their work right now. Mm -hmm. Um, And so being in that presence, I think, um, I think sometimes the change that happens to us is mental and verbal and other times it is this energetic piece that like we we can lock onto something and our whole bodies shift and change and being in a physical space with 250 women who are doing that work is such healing to our beings um and is if we choose to can be such an access point to touching the light and love and the power of who we are so um i'm i'm excited about being part of that community of women. I'm excited about seeing the light of all of the other speakers. I'm excited to share and talk and speak to both in workshop and speaking and maybe panel. I don't even know. I think we're doing everything. We're doing it all. all. Um, And uh, yeah, I'm very excited. And I'm also excited to meet parts of my light within the presence of other women that I have yet to know. Um, That's part of this work. So yeah, I'm I'm excited for all of it. We are so looking forward to taking this deeper and having you at the Rise event too, because it's it's going to be beautiful. And we're set in a castle. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yeah. Fairmont is also like one of my favorite hotels. I was like, great choice. <laughs> great choice. Yeah. It's going to be beautiful. Um, okay. Let's let's close this out. Women of distinction. Got it. Hopefully, I'm going to remember all this. I'm memorizing uh, four poems because I have my book launch event in Los Angeles on Wednesday, um, and. Uh, Yeah, so this poem, also a little blip before I share is, this poem is important to me because for a long time I thought that power was in um, the way I did videos, films, there was an energy that was very masculine. And this is one of the first poems I wrote that was from the power of the feminine. And accessing our power, not by trying to go out into the world and be powerful but relaxing into the power of the feminine and so this film i am a woman of distinction as well as the poem when i we made the video version of it when the filmmaker said what's your vision i was like i want this to be full of a soft power and grace and like flowing and women dancing and swimming and surfing which is what the film is and just really being knowing that their power is just being who they are um, rather than my first poem that was like, this is for the women who don't give a fuck. It was like very like, oh, masculine, which we need sometimes. We're all 33 parts feminine and masculine. So um, this was one of the first poems I wrote that I feel like I really accessed the feminine. Um, so yeah, I'm going to free flow. And if I don't remember all of it, I'm going to keep flowing. <laughs> so, so yeah, this one is called I Am a Woman of Distinction. So. I am a woman of distinction. 
recklessly beautiful and untamed. My heart is splayed wide open, for I not only trust the process, but I trust the force in which each one of my feet hits the ground and my ability to maneuver through the joys and grief I face each day. I walk tall, taller than an old cypress tree because I am at home in my skin. My self-worth lives in each nook and cranny of my spine. It is not contained in exterior what have yous like money, a piece of paper, a house, a car, a ring, or success. My success is in presence. I am present in the human beings I stumble upon like heartbeats at first light. I salsa dance bare bummed with bronze skin and white cheeks. Let the music sway and bend and dip my spirit with the grace of a dozen fireflies drunk on the moon's wine. I am dripping in salt, brown from the sunshine and barefoot in my beauty. I am not afraid to tell you that I am beautiful because I have done the work to be at home in my soul's skin. I am worthy, darling, oh so deliciously worthy. I do not shrink to accommodate the insecurities of those around me, but instead stand tall to remind them gently, why crouch? I do not try to fix or heal the suffering of this world. I know that by healing my suffering, I heal this world. I am a woman of distinction and I am not afraid to love you before you are ready. I open fearlessly and sweetly and ferociously with all the might I can for what good is living if we are not loving. I am here to love and love I will. I do not search for my power in this world. I rest into the empowerment I already am. I am a woman of distinction and I am not a victim of circumstance. I feel when things are out of alignment and I move from them with as much grace as I entered. I understand that no is self-love and everything after no is unworthiness. I am a woman of distinction my freedom is not kept in a cage that requires six whiskeys to be let loose. I drink the ocean for breakfast and kiss the red dirt for dessert. I dance and shimmy and shake and love through my life. I ground, ground through movement, through dance, through the sea. I am a woman of distinction. You will feel me when I walk into the room. <laughs> Ah, I feel so lucky that I just got to hear the like how you say those words. It's so so powerful. It's such a beautiful poem. So thank you for yeah. I've been rehearsing it in the ocean with random people. Oh, so with good. Myself and this guy from uh, South Africa was like, "What are you saying?" And I was like, "You want to hear it?" He was like, yeah. "It's really vulnerable to do it with one on one because you're really like speaking it into them," you know. And it's powerful too to speak poetry because we're speaking the poem, a poem into the cells. And when it's a poem that's about healing, there's like, there's something very therapeutic about it sometimes. So, mm -hmm. oh, beautiful. I'll do it at Rise. We'll do yeah, some. Yeah, we're gonna do it again. We're gonna do it. What does it mean to walk tall? Hmm. I think that walking tall is is just having the courage to be vulnerable to who we are. I don't think it's always about you know, I am not always confident. I am not always in my power. I think that walking tall is um, is touching the spine of who we are and living in that space. And um, actually the backstory between walk tall is um, a Deanne Whalen, of course, um, where I was talking about embodying our light and our power and how sometimes when I would walk into a room full of eyes on me when I was interning six years ago and it didn't matter if it was a what room it was, part of me would want to shrink. And she looked at me and said, 
Ugh, oh, Yana, I would have never have known. You walk tall like an old cypress tree for me. And so part of my mission is also my work, which is to continuously hold space for the light of who I am. And um, I believe that that is ongoing. And um, that is the healing, really the feminine needs right now is to walk tall within their feminine energy and to know that it is this great gift and power. Um, and so, yeah, so walking tall is, is embodying all of who we are. Mm, I love that. This series is all about supporting our community with a little bit of action that they can take before they come to rise. And the one thing that's really resonated with me of, you know, everything we talked about today, and there's been so many powerful, um, powerful stories that you've shared and just vulnerability that have really inspired me to look at some different things going on in my life. But the one thing that's really standing out as sort of something that people can take away from this call is, can you change one thing? Can you make that one move? Can you move cities? Can you quit the job? Can you, you know, what is the one thing that you could do that you would feel safe enough to do? And um, yeah, that, it, it, it all starts there. And like, where do I feel trapped and how can I choose myself deeper? Mm -hmm. Is a good question. And also to note, I do want to say to people because often when we're feeling trapped in a career sense, we really struggle with um, how do I get out? And I just think that people have this sometimes romantic notion that they need to like jump off the ship into the deep end full of sharks and just like completely throw themselves on their passion before their business is even created. And I just want to say that sometimes having the courage to start is still having your job, like acknowledging that it's like, yeah, okay, this is not my thing. And I need to build the foundation of a business that will eventually financially support me. And I might be doing that on the weekend for now, or I might be working this job part-time and get dedicating myself to building a business in my vocation or my Dharma. And that that's not failing because we're so hard on ourselves. And we also think it has to be so dramatic. And it's like, if you are aware that you had this other passion that you wanted to build into a business, maybe your one thing is dedicating two Saturdays a month for a little while to that thing and to that business plan and to those ideas and to be also so soft and compassionate and loving on how, on, on the time that it takes to build a business that supports you and on that part of the journey um, in the marriage to our vocation and our Dharma, because it is, I think that's like, some people feel like a failure if they have a business as a yoga teacher and they're still working as an assistant somewhere. And that hurts us so deeply. So um, mm -hmm. yes, making a list of things, but if, if you're watching this and your thing is I wanna change my, my job, it took me two years to fully support myself financially in my business and um, don't have shame if you need to build it on the weekend for a little while. And uh, yeah, so that feels important to say, but yes, just looking, making a list of where do I feel trapped and what are some actions I can take right now? And what are some actions I need to have a little bit of patience with because um, there will always be immediate and things that we do need to have patience with, I think. Mm, beautiful. Thank you for that, um, for that wisdom. And we will see you in just a couple months. I so appreciate you take, taking the time to connect and get up early and hang out with me this morning and share this, uh, this conversation. And Yana, I'm so excited to rise with you. Yeah, it's been a delight. Thank you for having me.